Welcome to another exciting podcast of Royal Oak Victory Church. We're glad you've joined us. We are a community devoted to God, connected to others, and influencing our world. And um, you know what it's like uh, when you surf the web, lots of interesting, maybe some not so interesting things on there, but uh, you know when I was uh, on the internet I came across uh, this right here. And um, if you're wondering exactly what that is, uh, it's a bottle of what the manufacturer calls happy pills. How many could use a bottle of that? Um, happy pills, pills that make you happy. And so curious about exactly what they might put in those pills, um, I began scrolling down uh, the ad to get a clearer description. And this is what it said. This is a description of, uh, of this product. Each one of these little capsules contains an inspire, inspirational quote to help brighten your day. Take one daily, or if you are really depressed, take as many as is needed. Um, inspiring quotes that you uh, read through the day. And then posted right at the very bottom of the ad, I thought this was interesting, there was a caution, a warning, and it says, may cause contagious smiling and happiness. And I thought, wow, as soon as I read it, I thought, wow, I could use a little bit more of that. Contagious smiling and happiness. How many, how many could use a bit more of that in your life? Turn to the person next to you and just contagiously smile at them. Just give them a smile. And um, so happy pills, contagiously smiling. And so, of course, you know, even getting more curious, I, uh, I went to the very bottom and I wondered how much these happy pills were. And then, of course, that's when all my anticipated happiness and joy flew out the window. Because the price of these happy pills are $49.99 U.S. And as we know, that's about 500 Canadian dollars. <laughs> and so I didn't buy them. I, I just want to let you know I didn't buy them. Um, I thought, wow, in some ways, that's a lot of money for a bottle of temporary happiness, right? But as we know, um, uh, inevitably, uh, some people will, will, will take out their hard-earned cash and pay it because that's the way we are in this culture today, that we want happiness now. I mean, we want joy now. We want a deep sense of excitement, satisfaction now, and we'll pretty much do anything, pay anything to get it. That's the kind of society we live in. And whether it's found in a pill or a bottle or a position or a status, whether our happiness is in a possession or a thing, a person, a place, or even a Pokemon. I went downtown just Friday night. Clarice and I happened to go downtown uh, at Princess Island Park. I don't know if you've been down there recently. I mean, it is invaded with Pokemon. There are so many people there catching Pokemon. I think it's probably one of the dangerous places in the city because the people aren't even looking at you. They're smashing into each other. And, um, but they got to catch them all, right? <laughs> and so um, whether you find happiness in a pill, a person, a place, a Pokemon, the reality is, is that all of us, whether we realize it or not, we're on a lifelong pursuit for this thing called happiness. And, of course, that's why the words of Jesus become so important and transformative to us. Because right in the midst of what I call this happy, hungry, dissatisfied world, he stands up and tells us exactly the place true happiness can be found. And that it's not in a bottle and it's not in a pill. It's not in a, in a possession or a person or a thing. But rather, true happiness is found as we learn to live in harmony with God's kingdom and purposes in our lives. And so that's what I want to talk about this morning. Um, those of you who've been with us for the past several months now, really through the summer months, we've been um, uh, looking at a series we have entitled Happy. Let's say that together. Happy. Eight uncommon characteristics of a happy life. And, of course, um, this series is taken uh, from what you could describe as one of the greatest sermons that's ever been preached. It's commonly referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. 
And it's here in this sermon that Jesus preaches. He begins to touch on what we commonly refer to as the Beatitudes. And simply summed up, the Beatitudes are eight very powerful, profound characteristics that represent both those of us who are in the kingdom and those of us who are pursuing the kingdom. They're eight characteristics of kingdom life. And of course, that's why we call them uncommon, because they are pretty much opposite of what is considered to be normal and ordinary today. They're uncommon. And those of you who've been with us through the series, you know that we have touched on the first four of them. And what I'd like to do this morning is move on to the fifth. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn them on or turn them to uh, our text. And that's Matthew 5, verse 1. Matthew 5, verse 1. And so let's pick it up here uh, in verse 1. It says, In seeing the multitudes, he, Jesus, went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We talked about that. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We talked about that. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And then the one I want to focus on this morning is here in verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain what? Mercy. Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. And of course, as we've already mentioned in this series, the word blessed, because it's not exactly a, a, a common word. You know, it's not like we go and use that word every day. The word blessed actually means to be fortunate, to be favored, to be cheerful, to be delighted. In fact, the very best English word when it comes to accurately describing what the word blessed is all about, it's really the word happy. And that's why we've called this series Happy, Eight Common Characteristics of a Happy Life. It's because these are the very things we do to find true happiness and contentment, satisfaction in life. And of course, here Jesus shares yet another one with us. He says, you are blessed, you are happy, you are satisfied when you are merciful, for by doing so you will obtain mercy. And so this morning what I want to do is kind of unpack this verse for you. And the way I want to do it is just uh, break it down in some uh, bite-sized pieces. You know, the first thing I see here is what I call the setting of mercy. The setting. Mercy's setting. The setting in which Jesus spoke these words. And of course, you don't get that by just reading it. But if you took the time to sit down and, and, um, and dig a little bit deeper, you would discover that the setting in which Jesus spoke these words could have easily been classified as one of the cruelest, most merciless times in all of human history. That is the setting in which Jesus spoke these words. That both governmentally and religiously this time uh, of history was unmerciful. Uh, when you talk about government, it, the, the people were under one of the most brutal, merciless governments that had ever been in power, and that was none other than the Romans. Governmentally and then religiously, they were under one of the most unforgiving, inflexible religious systems that had ever been instituted, um, and that would be the Jewish religion as it was taught by the scribes and the Pharisees. And so both those things, government and religion, came together like a perfect storm to create one of the harshest, most unmerciful societies that had ever existed. I mean, take the Romans, for instance. They had no place even in their vocabulary for mercy. They didn't value mercy. It was not one of their philosophies. Matter of fact, one famous Roman philosopher of that day said this about mercy. He said that mercy is the disease of the soul, a clear sign of both personal and social weakness. That's how the Romans saw mercy. They glorified justice and courage. They valued discipline and power. They reveled in violence and brutality. They looked down on those who happened to show any measure of mercy whatsoever because that is what only weak and defective people do. In fact, in the Roman culture, when a child was born, the father had the legal right to allow that child to live or die. 
And if he held his thumb up when he saw the child, that means the child would live. If he put his thumb down, that means that they would take that child and immediately it would be drowned. That was the culture in which they lived. You know, there was no mercy. If, if for some reason a Roman citizen uh, didn't like the slave that uh, was working for them anymore, he could take out a knife and kill them right there on the spot, and there was no penalty for doing that. That was the mindset that Jesus spoke these words into. It was violent. It was cruel. It was unbending. It was merciless. And so when you take the government of that day and mix it with the religion the people were forced to follow, you had one of the harshest times in human history. And you know, many of us who are familiar with the Gospels, uh, we know what kind of religion uh, the people were under those kinds of days. It was a religion that viewed common people as being sinful and unclean, not to be associated with. That's how the, they thought about just the common man. It was a religion that took people who spoke blasphemies, broke the Sabbath, committed adultery, and publicly stoned them. It was a religion when speaking to its leaders, Jesus said these very words. He said, you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you crush people with unbearable religious demands and never lift a finger to ease the burden yourself. That's what Jesus, how he described the religion of the day. He said, you pay tithes of mint and anise. He says, and yet you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, faith, and mercy. That's what Jesus said. And so it's in this setting, Jesus stands up and speaks these very strange, uncommon, uncultural words. Blessed are the merciful. It went against the grain of everything that was believed and said and practiced in that day. And if anyone else had said them, they would have laughed him to scorn and run him out of town instantly. But it wasn't just anyone. It was Jesus. It was Jesus. And that really brings me to my second point this morning. The first one is the setting of mercy. The, the second one is the source of mercy. Mercy source. And of course you see it here that these words didn't come from just any teacher, any rabbi, any preacher, but rather they flowed from the lips of the most caring, kind, compassionate, loving, merciful person who had ever walked the earth. The very God-man, Jesus Christ. And of course we see his mercy not only in, in the words that he spoke, but also in the life that he lived. And that wherever he went, whatever he did, he extended mercy and grace to those around him. That he laid hands on the sick and he healed them. That's mercy. That he reached out to the cripple and the lame and caused them to walk again. That is mercy. That he returned sight to the blind and, and hearing to the deaf and speech to the dumb. That is mercy. Jesus not only spoke, but lived the language, the life of mercy. He reached out to the prostitutes and the tax collectors in love. Those who were looked upon as rejects, outcasts of society. Jesus drew them into his circle, not to judge them and condemn them, but to redeem them and give them a new start and a new life and forgiven and cleansed by God the Father. That's what Jesus did. He sat with the grieving and he wept with the hurting. He sought out the lonely he gathered the little children and loved them. You know, back then, people didn't have any time for children. They pushed them aside, not Jesus. Jesus ate with the tax collectors and sinners. He valued them. Never was there a human being on the face of the earth who expressed and walked in mercy like Jesus did. You see that. I mean, once he's, he's going along the streets and a funeral procession comes by and seeing the mother sobbing and weeping because her son had died, premature death, her son was dead, Jesus puts his hand on the casket and raises the child from the dead. That is mercy. Other people, they wouldn't have cared. People die all the time. Tough luck. That's the way the world is. Jesus was so moved by mercy, he raised the dead boy from the dead. 
just to relieve the suffering and the pain. A woman caught in the very act of adultery is hauled into the courtyard to be publicly stoned. Jesus looks at her, and after confronting her accusers, he forgives her and says, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. That is mercy. And, of course, the whole reason why Jesus was exactly that, could be that, merciful, kind, compassionate, loving, is because that's exactly the way the, the Father in heaven is. Some of us are familiar with the verse. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You want to know what the Father's like? You want to know what God's like? Look at me. And so when we speak of the source of all mercy, what we're really talking about is finding it in God. And I don't know if you've found mercy yet, but finding it in God because God is both the starting point, the origin, the fountainhead from where all mercy flows and touches. And of course you see this over and over again in Scripture. David the psalmist said in Psalm 85, 86 verse 5, You, Lord, are good and ready to forgive, abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. The Bible says that God is abundant in mercy. This word abundant here speaks of a fullness of mercy. It's talking about an abounding, overflowing measure of mercy that God is that way when it comes to to how he deals with us. Overflowing mercy. But you know, not only does this word have to do with the quantity of mercy, but the quality as well. It also embraces the whole concept of strength, strength, that God is strong in mercy. And so that means that uh, as powerful and pervasive, and I want you to hear me this morning, as powerful and pervasive as your failures, as your faults, as your sins, as your transgressions before God might be, how many of you know God's mercy is stronger? It's stronger. It's stronger. And I want you to think about that because I think that some of us here, we live under a cloud of guilt and condemnation. We feel that we've gone too far. You know, we've, we feel that we've just blown it too many times. We feel that, you know, we've, we've lost favor with God, and yet you need to understand that there isn't one sin that you've ever committed that is stronger than God's mercy and love and grace towards us. And that wherever we might find ourselves in life, and I don't know where you're at this morning, but wherever you might find yourself, there's no place too dark, too far, too sinful that God in his mercy can't come down and reach and lift us up. Amen? And that's why David said what he did in Psalm 145.9. It says the Lord is good to a few people. Is that what he says? The Lord is good to how many? To everyone. He showers mercy on all his creation. All his creation. And you know, the last time I checked, all of us were part of that creation. Is there anybody here who's not part of creation? Okay, I'm glad. You're part of creation. Now, I don't know how you think about yourself, but you're part of God's creation. And here, David says that God showers. He shows mercy on all of God's creation. In other words, God wants to show mercy on you. Turn the person next, you say. It's talking about you. Tell them that. Mercy for you. I, I, I love what, what the prophet Micah said in Micah seven eighteen. Who is God like you? Pardoning iniquity, passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in what? Mercy. God delights in mercy. One translation says it like this. God takes pleasure in showing us his constant love. Another one says, for mercy is God's specialty. And that's what he loves doing the most, showing mercy. And so I know sometimes we think, oh, no, I'm going to God again with the same problems, the same faults, the same failures, the same sins. And we almost get this picture that God is, is, is just puts up with us. Oh, not you again. 
Not you again. What are you doing here again? And it's almost like we come into the presence of God as beggars. That's not what the Bible says. It says that when we come into the, in, in, to God in, in our darkness and in our weakness, God delights in showing us grace and mercy. He draws us in. He doesn't push us away. I love what the prophet Jeremiah said in Lamentations 3.21. He says, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Mercies new every morning. I want you to think about that. What that means is that God has a gift of mercy for each and every one of us. Fresh every morning. New mercies every morning. And so the question I want to ask you this morning is, have you received your portion of mercy for today? Did you receive your portion of mercy yesterday? What about the day before? Some of us have gone days, weeks, maybe months, never receiving the portion of God's mercy for us. No wonder we live in, in, in such fear and uncertainty. We don't know what God thinks about us. Sometimes we think that God is against us, and yet the Bible is clear. It's clear that if we come to Him with a repentant heart, that He will give us a fresh dose of mercy every single day. I think all of us probably have our three square meals a day. We eat breakfast every day. I want to challenge you every single morning before you do anything, get a fresh dose of mercy for that day. That's what the Bible says. It amazes me how many Christians walk around in guilt and shame, condemnation, fear, not realizing that God has a fresh portion of mercy and grace for them each and every day. It's no wonder the writer of Hebrews says what he does in Hebrews 4.16. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God that we will receive his what? Mercy. And we will find grace to help us when we need it the most. It's an invitation that when you're doing your worst, come and get God's best. I know that some people, when they're at their worst, they feel like they need to take steps away from God. They start getting ruled by fear and guilt. They take steps away from God. And yet what the Bible says is that when we are at our worst, we are to take steps to God, towards God. Let's boldly come towards His throne. Because when we do, we will find mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. And so the first thing we see here about mercy is, is the setting. The setting, the second thing is, 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 is the source. It's, it, it comes from God. And then the last thing I see here is what I call the cycle of mercy. And then when it comes to God's mercy, there is a very clear, definitive promise that God gives us here. Jesus says it. He says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain what? Mercy. Mercy, that's the promise. If you're merciful, if you're merciful towards others, God will be merciful towards you. It's a cycle of mercy. And you know, before I share with you what I believe this verse is saying, I would like to briefly touch on a few things it's not saying. Okay? The first thing it's not saying is that if I'm caring and compassionate, merciful and kind to other people, they will in turn automatically be exactly that back to me. This verse is not saying that. And the reason why it's not saying that is because how many know it doesn't work that way? How many have discovered that? Right? That sometimes the, the, the people whom you are the most kind and merciful towards are the very ones who end up being the cruelest and most unmerciful back to you. How many have discovered that? Mercy given doesn't necessarily mean mercy received. I mean, you saw that so clearly in the life of Christ. He was the most merciful, compassionate human being that ever lived. And yet the very ones whom he showed mercy to, many of them were the very ones who spit in his face. They screamed for his blood. They nailed him to a cross. And they waited for him to die. 
And so that's not what this verse is saying, that if we're merciful to others, they will in turn be merciful to us. Don't ever believe that, because if you do, you will be sorely disappointed. You, 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 you will be disappointed because you'll find that the pe- person you're the kindest to, some of them, are not kind back. That's the first thing this verse isn't saying. You know, the second thing it's not saying is that if we are kind and compassionate and merciful and loving to others, then God in turn will look down upon us, see how wonderful of a person we are, and because we are so wonderful, he'll scoop us up and take us to heaven when we die. That's not what this verse is saying. It's not saying that if we do gracious, merciful deeds of benevolence and mercy down here, then somehow God will grant me a place, a mansion in heaven when I meet him face to face. That is not what this verse is saying because as we, we need to understand that mercy is not something you work for. Mercy is not for merit. If mercy was for merit, then it wouldn't even be called mercy. You can't mercy your way to heaven. You can't work your way to heaven. You can't give your way to heaven or pray your way to heaven. You can't do enough things to earn mercy because mercy can't be earned. And, of course, that's why Paul says what he does in Ephesians 2, verse 7. He says that in the time to come, God might make clear the full wealth of his grace in his mercy towards us in Christ Jesus. How does he do that? He says, by grace you have salvation, through faith, and that not of yourself. It is given by God, not of works, so that no man can take glory to himself. What Paul is saying is you can't work your way into heaven by being merciful to those around you. All you can do is wave the white flag of surrender and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Save me by your grace. That is the way, the ticket, how we receive salvation. Amen? Amen? And so what Jesus is saying here is not if we're merciful to God, then he will get us to heaven. What he is saying here is that as we express and show mercy to others, we will in turn experience a little bit more of his heaven, heaven here on earth as we show mercy. And the way I like to think about of it is that mercy is like water in a bucket. And that the more I can pour out, the more I can share, the more I can spill on others, then the more God will spill it out on me. It's like a bucket. And so some people, you know, they have a hard time showing mercy. They don't have buckets. They have thimbles. Right? And a little bit of mercy to you. Oh, ran out. (laughs) Sorry, honey. Ran out of mercy. Sorry, kids. Up to your room. Time out. (laughs) Grounded for 50 years. (laughs) Ran out of mercy. Why? Because there's symbols of mercy. A little bit of mercy here. Maybe every Christmas a bit of mercy over there. And so we walk around with thimbles of mercy. You know what? If we are in the habit of using thimbles of mercy, God thimbles us with some mercy. (laughs) Say, man, I could use more, Lord. Sorry. (laughs) Give me a break, Lord. Sorry. You use a thimble, I'll use a thimble. Sorry. You know what? We need to get rid of our thimbles, and we need to take out our buckets. Amen? Buckets of mercy. Right? This is a small bucket. Get a bigger bucket. And fill your bucket with mercy and wherever you're. Throw it on people there and throw it on them there. I'll tell you, you talk about the setting of mercy. We live in a merciless society. People are pushed under. We, we are surrounded by hurting and broken people all around us. And what we ought to do is take out our buckets and let's throw some mercy. Let's saturate this lost and broken world with the grace and mercy of God. And the promise is is that as we throw buckets of mercy, then when we need it, God will bucket us back. How many could use a fresh bucket of mercy? I know I get myself in situations where I, you know, a thimble ain't going to do it. I need a bucket. God, I need a bucket of mercy. He says, I got one for you. 
It's, it's the result of the mercy through what you have been shown. I mean, this principle is all through the Bible. David said in 2 Samuel twenty two twenty six, 26, With the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. With a blameless man, you will show yourself blameless. That is the cycle of mercy. I love what James said in James 2.13. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown it to others. But, how many thank God for the buts of the word? But, but, but if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. In other words, when you come to receive mercy from God, he'll say, how merciful have you have been? Not for salvation, but just living our everyday, regular lives. God will have an abundant supply of mercy for us because we have been willing and, 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 and selfless to pour it out to others. And so the question I want you to ask yourself this morning is just, how is your mercy bucket doing? How's it doing? Is it full and running over? Do you use it often in many places towards many people? Or have you found that it's kind of empty, right? It's just kind of empty. It's not that important to me. How is your mercy bucket doing? It's a, it's, it's a good question. We ought to ask ourselves. Every now and again, how am I doing when it comes to the showing of and giving of mercy? I know it's hard. In fact, it can be one of the most difficult, challenging things we ever do, the showing of mercy. Especially towards people who frustrate us or, or who have hurt us, who are rude and unkind to us. It's hard to give mercy to those people, but God says, I've given it to you, give it back to them. It's hard. Of course, you know, one of the things that makes showing mercy hard is, is sometimes we, we just get so busy living our lives, right? We're so busy. I find that in, in, in Calgary. Everyone's so busy. They're so driven. Their calendars are so full. They don't write in. I'm just as, as much to blame. We don't write in times of showing mercy. We're just so busy and driven. It's like the, the story of the Good Samaritan. I really think that one of the main reasons why the priest and the lawyer didn't stop and help the man who had been beaten up was because uh, th th they just didn't have the time. Right? The priest, he was busy going to the temple to pray to God. The lawyer, his calendar was full. They didn't have the time. They didn't show the mercy because their schedules were filled with everything else. And that's why I believe one of the greatest hindrances for us when it comes to being more merciful is not that we don't want to do it. We just get caught up, caught up, caught up living our own lives that we really don't stop and notice those around us. You know, this was really hit home to me a, a while back, and I'm going to close with this story. But it was a Sunday evening a while ago. I was coming home from a meeting. And, you know, I hadn't had supper yet, so I thought I'd stop by one of my very favorite takeout places and order some food to go, to take with me. And some of you may have have visited that place. It's called Chicken on the Way. How many? Yeah, that's, that's an awesome place. I love it. I mean, I'd go there all the time, but th if I did, I'd weigh 300 more pounds than I weigh now. Every so often, I'll treat myself. So I, dr I drove into the parking lot of Chicken on the Way, got out of my car, and as I was headed to the front door, I noticed a man who was sitting close to the door against the wall. Just happened to notice him. He never really looked at me. I never really looked at him. I just went into the restaurant. And when I got into the restaurant, I began to read the menu board, and I decided what I wanted. And as I, uh, I, I was getting things settled in my mind, the gal in front of me, she, she put in her order. And she said, I'll have this, and, and give me two of them. That's what she said. I never thought anything of it. I placed my order, and as I was waiting, the way it happened to work is we got our food at exactly the same time. She got her order, I got mine, and so we were both leaving together. We walked out of the door together, and as we stepped out of the door, she sh suddenly turns to this man, gets on her knees, and hands him a, 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 a bag of food. Hands him 
one bag of her food. She ordered two, one for her. I guess the other one was for him. And totally shocked. I mean, he was shocked. He looked up at her, and with the biggest toothless grin you've ever seen in your life, he just smiled at her and said, Oh, thank you, ma'am. I just love chicken and fries. And I got in my car, and as I was driving out of the parking lot, all the way home, I was wondering, why didn't I do that? I'm a pastor. I'm a Christian. I'm a holy man of God. Why didn't I do that? And, you know, the more I thought about it, the more I, it's not that I'm heartless, you know, that I'm an unmerciful t tyrant. I have no compassion for the poor. That wasn't it at all. What came to me is that I just lived my life so busy. I never saw that man, not really. Not really. I never saw him because I wasn't really looking. The reason why I wasn't looking is because I was simply too busy living my full and busy life. And you know, as I'm driving home, the smell of chicken in my car, God began to convict me. And he told me, he told me it's time to slow down. It's time to slow down and start noticing the things that are important to me. The things that are precious to me. And those kinds of things are showing compassion and kindness and caring, grace, love and mercy in this cruel and merciless world. That is what is important to God. And Lord, help us if we get so busy that we don't take the time to do that. I mean, those are the words that God spoke to me. Since then, I've, I've tried. I've tried to, to do better. Sometimes I'm better, and sometimes I fall into the same pattern. But I pray the prayer, Lord, make me an instrument of your mercy. Let me see people as you see them. Give me your heart for them so I can feel the, the love that you have for them. May I feel that. That's the prayer I pray. Because I, I believe the promise. I believe that as we do that, as we're merciful, uh, we will obtain mercy. And, and by doing that, we will step that much closer to the happy, satisfying, blessed life that Jesus talks about. As we express mercy, we'll receive it back. And you know, I want to close with just two qu quick scriptures. Proverbs 3, verse 3. Look at this. This is a challenge. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablets of your heart. In other words, the writer is saying, learn to be a merciful person. Intentionally, purposefully, bind them around your neck. Write mercy on your heart. Wherever you go, have an eye for the hurting and the broken. Broken. Make mercy a priority. And then, of course, the other scripture is found in Psalm 23. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I love it. It's a, it's a twofold truth. Let's wear mercy as a garment to those around us. It's hard, sometimes challenging. It'll take a death to ourselves. But you know, as we do it, God promises us that surely goodness and mercy will follow us, not just one day or two days, all the days of our lives. We will experience the mercy of God as He pours it back out on us. You know, we have a ministry here in the church. We call it His Hands. It really is a ministry of mercy. Sherry Lowen and Jackie Stefanowski headed up. It's, it's a beautiful ministry here at the church. We visit seniors' homes and conduct services three Sundays a month. We 
we're in seniors' homes. We do children's outreaches in Forest Lawn. We, we, we do an outreach dinner at the East Side Church, our Victory Church in Forest Lawn every month. 300 people we serve every month. Uh, once a month, we serve uh, food at the Ronald McDonald House for people whose lives are in crisis because their children are sick. And we show mercy to them. Every week we are in the Reman Center with a Bible study. We're, 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 we're every week we're in the Correctional Center with a Bible study. We do annual food and clothing drives and all kinds of things. You know, if you want to know more about our His Hands ministry, you'll see it on our website. You can sign up there. If you want to be part of it, it's just a great way to, 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 to extend the mercy of God in this merciless, broken world. Email us here at the church. Email Sherry at ROVC. You can be part of it. But that's how we bind mercy around our necks. That's how we write it on our ta tablets of our heart. And as we do, God promises that it will follow us. He will pour it out upon us. How many believe that this morning? I want us to stand and we're going to pray. You've been so gracious. But let's dedicate ourselves to God this morning as instruments of mercy. Really, that ought to be one of the main missions of the church. That rather than judging and condemning, that's what people think Christians do. They're experts at judging and condemning. Lord, make us instruments of mercy and grace. Let's pray. Give us eyes to see. Father, give us the time. Let us slow down. Father, give us your heart so that we might reach out to the lost and broken that we come across, that we have the ability to, to see them as you see them. Father, I pray that you would impart that to us. In Jesus' name. You know, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, how many here you would say, you know, Pastor, I need what you were talking about today. It's called mercy for salvation. I don't work my way to, I, I realize that. I, I need to receive the gift of salvation. Put Christ in, first in my life. Accept him as leader and Lord. With our heads bowed, our eyes closed, is there anybody here who, who would say, you know, Pastor, pray for me. Just lift your hand. You'd like to receive the mercy of Christ, salvation. Anybody just lift your hand up? You'd like a prayer? Is there anybody? Anybody at all? Thank you for that hand. Anybody else? F Father, we thank you for these hands. And I want you to just give your, yourself to God in a fresh way. Give yourself to Christ. Father, we thank you that uh, these here today have waved the white flag of surrender to you surrendering in your mercy and grace. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's give the Lord a